Hi and welcome to Midnight Cry. I'm your host, Rama Gassane, and today we have with us Jay Smith, who will be discussing with us a little bit further about the test or the criteria of a prophet. Welcome to the show, Jay. Hey, it's good to be here. Now, in the last segment, we were able to talk about the test or the criteria of a prophet. And we were able to look at some passages from the Quran. Then we ended up talking about some passages from the Bible. And if we can continue on with that, because I think we only discussed the first point. Actually, we've, we've discussed the first two points. The first two, yes. Because there's four criteria that we look to that, uh, that, that the Bible uh, stipulates. And we need to go to the Bible if we're Christians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to have some type of foundation to know what a prophet is, who a prophet is, uh, and who the, who the Bible considers can hold that mantle. Uh, and so whenever we're faced with a prophet, whether it's Muhammad or uh, a, the, uh, the prophet Buddha or the prophet, uh, the many Hindu prophets, uh, certainly the prophet Joseph Smith that the Mormons like to claim as a prophet, uh, others, Sun Young Moon that has come more recently, Gulab Ahmad that we refer to back in the 1800s in Kashmir who claimed to be a prophet, all these prophets must fulfill the criteria that the Bible stipulates. And the Bible is very clear. And there are four that we can find. One, of course, we talked in the last segment, he must be in the prophetic race. I think we pretty well stipulated and enlarged on that, uh, looking at the, the uh, Genesis 17, which, uh, where Abraham asks this very question uh, concerning his son Ishmael. And God eradicates Ishmael very quickly by saying, he will bless him, but he is not in the covenant. The covenant mm. is with Isaac. It's very clear in chapter 22 that that covenant uh, comes through Isaac because he asks only for Isaac, your one and only son. Very clear that as far as God is concerned, Abraham only had one son. And then, of course, we went uh, finished off with Galatians 4, where Paul continues that theme. And he says there are two different covenants from two different women that represents these two covenants. You have the covenant of the slave woman, Hagar, and you have the covenant that comes from the free woman, Sarah. And yes. then it says in that chapter, have nothing to do with the slave woman's son. We're to have nothing to do with Ishmael. We're to have nothing to do that comes from Ishmael. And if Muslims want to believe that uh, Muhammad comes in the line of Ishmael, then the Bible very clearly says to us we're not to have anything to do with mm -hmm. Muhammad. Yes. That's very clear. Then we went into the whole problem of revelation itself. Prophets receive revelation. That's their function. And the revelation that we see in the prophets here all correspond. God does not contradict himself. So every one of the prophets, their revelations correspond with that which has come ahead. And you can see the line of God's redemptive plan right through the Old Testament fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And they're all pointing to Jesus Christ. Then you come to this book and suddenly, wham, it comes and slams you in the face. Mm. This rejects most of everything that this book's talking about. Not only does it reject the God that is in this book, kind of God that we see here, the God that comes to earth and walks and talks and has relationship with us. This God is totally different, but certainly it rejects Jesus as God and spends much of its time dis confronting that notion. So certainly you cannot say that these are same from the same prophetic line. Mm -hmm. And if this does come from a prophet named Muhammad, then why is it that this revelation is so contradictory with this revelation? Yes. Now we're going to go into two other criteria. And the, the next criteria has to do with the function of the prophet. Not only do they receive revelation, but they have to have authority for their revelation. They must do something to prove they're a prophet. And every prophet must do one of two things. Either they must do a miracle, or they must do a prophecy. And now, when you look and ask Muhammad, what miracle did he do? Well, this is actually, uh, asked by the Jews at the time of Muhammad when he was living there in Medina. The Jews come up to him and it says, in fact, let me just open up the scriptures because this comes out in uh, Surah 17, uh, verses 90 to 93. Surah 17, the Jews ask this question and it says, and they, the Jews say, we shall not believe in you, that's, that means believe in you, Muhammad, until you cause a spring to gush forth from the earth for us, or you have a garden of date palms and grapes, and cause rivers to gush forth in its midst abundantly, or you cause the heaven to fall upon us in pieces, as you have pretended, or you bring Allah and the angels before us face to face, or you have a house of the zukruf, uh, which means like silver or pure gold, or you ascend up into the sky, and even then we will put no faith in your ascension until you bring down for us a book that we would read. There's the challenge mm -hmm. by the Jews to Muhammad right there. Do these things. Show us. Prove to us that you're a prophet. All the other prophets did miracles. Show us a miracle. 
And these are the same questions that people should be asking today, yeah, right? This is a yeah. great question. I think mm. this is a great challenge. We need to ask, what miracle did Muhammad do? I ask this all the time at Speaker's Corner. I get up there on the ladder and I say, okay, Muslims, come and help me. What miracle did you do? What's, what, are some do? Of, what are some of the responses no, that they you talk get? about uh, he split the moon. Surah 54, Ayah 1 refers to the splitting of the moon. And it's very clear that Muhammad's name is not in there. In fact, I'll just read it to you. Surah 54, and if, if you have your Quran, you can read it as well to make sure that I'm on track. And make what sure. translation of the Quran are you reading there? I'm reading from Hilali and Khan. Mm -hmm. The reason I use this translation is not because it's the best. In fact, it's one of the worst. It's the one the Muslims like. That's why it's one of the worst ones because they like it because it's full, what we call an apologetical translation. Okay. It mistranslates. I don't have time to get into that right now. But it's the one that I have to use at Speaker's Corner. It's one that Muslims demand that I use, so that's why I use it. But it's officially accepted by Muslims? Only Muslims. Okay. No, this is not sold in any reputable bookstore. Mm -hmm. No good bookstore would sell this because it's a terrible translation. Mm -hmm. The better translations you would use would be Arbery or Rodman. Those are you find in the better bookstores. Okay. Because they stick to the Arabic. Uh -huh. And because of that, they're not liked by Muslims. <laughs> mm. So you might say that if, if it's liked by Muslims, you're pretty well going to not get a great translation. If it's disliked, you pretty well get a good translation. Okay. Rule of thumb. I'm, this is Jay Smith speaking, but this is <laughs> what I found working with Muslims for 30 years now. Surah 54, Ayah 1 says, The hour has drawn near, and the moon has been cleft asunder. That's all it says. Muhammad's name is not there. This has nothing to do with Muhammad. Mm. Muslims would like it to be a Muhammad, and that's why they, they throw this at you whenever you ask what is that miracle that he has done, they throw this verse at you without realizing that none of the exegetes would agree with them. If you look at all the exegetes, including Baidawi, Zamakshari, Suyuti, Tabari, any of them, they all point to this verse concerning the last times. This is, ah. shows the beginning of the last time. It's a future rendition. It's, it's future. talking about when the last time comes. It's when the, the moon will be cleft asunder. So when the moon is cleft asunder, that's the beginning of the last time. So that's what Islamic sources, Islamic commentators yeah. are saying. Yeah. Now, there's nothing about Muhammad in this. But Muslims need to find some type of authority for the mm. Prophet. Because if everything they believe in rests on the shoulders of one man, they've got to find something for us to prove that he's a Prophet. And so, that's why they like to point to that verse. So at Speaker's Corner, uh, do they also have any other responses other than the miracle? Well, before we of get the on to the other response, okay. let's go on. Say, what do you do with this? I remember, maybe you remember this, being as old as you are, you have some gray hair. Remember back when um, Armstrong went to the moon? Mm -hmm. And uh, when they went on the back side of the moon during the moonshot in the 1970s, they took pictures. And, on the, and one of the pictures was a long line that went across the moon, it looked like a large valley. I remember all over the Muslim world. <laughs> that there was a huge pronouncement saying, ah, finally we have proof. There is the fissure in the moon that proves that the moon really? was cleft wow. asunder. It was all over the Muslim world. I remember I was a young boy at the time, and I kind of laughed when I heard about it because the astronauts, not in the astronauts, but the NASA said very clearly, this is not a fissure. The moon has never been split mm -hmm. asunder. Uh, that is not a result of the moon being split asunder. But I have to, I remember I, I go down to Speaker's Corner, I ask this question, okay, Muslims, do you really believe that the moon was split asunder by Muhammad in the seventh century AD? Okay. And, and more than that, it, it, uh, according to the, the traditions, when the moon was split asunder, it was brought down to, on either side of a mountain. Now, stop and ask yourself, Rommel, in the 7th century, if the moon had been split asunder and brought down to, uh, to be on either side of a mountain, don't you think there would have been someone that ob observed that? <laughs> yes, that's right. How big do you think the moon is? Yeah. It's a pretty big object. <laughs> yes, that's right. To be brought down that close to the Earth, don't you think it had some pull on the gravitational force of the Earth? Yes, yes, most Don't certainly. you think there have been earthquakes all over the world? There have been a huge, enormous part of the Earth would have been blackened out some, just by the size of the moon. Someone somewhere would have Somewhere would have observed about it. it. Yes, yes. I, I asked this to my Muslim friends at Speaker's Corner. Don't you think someone would have observed the moon being mm. destroyed like that, split asunder? And even, I'm not suggesting that God is not able to do that. I'm saying, is it observable? Was it observable? Yes. Did it really historically happen? And I have Muslim after Muslim, yes. That makes sense. Yes, yes it happened. Mm. I said, well, where's the observation of this? And why, is it had, why has there not been any geological uh, ramifications to say nothing of what it would have done to the waves? Mm. <laughs> Nonetheless, as, as much as, as the, you can get out of that, you can see there's a real problem here. Because the, the verse itself doesn't even assume that. Mm. So then I asked, well, what is this miracle? Where is this miracle? And then I go back and I just look at the Quran itself because over and over again, the Quran gives the answer. Muhammad is very clear that he did not do any miracles. And not once, not twice. Once. I think there was several Yeah, let me just passages. give the references. Yes. 
Just look at Surah 2, Ayah 118 to 119. Just look at Surah 6, Ayah 37. Look at 6, Ayah 124. Just look at Surah 13, Ayah 7. Look at Surah 17, Ayah 59. In every one of these cases, over and over again, the response from, from Muhammad himself is, I'm nothing more than a warner. Can we possibly read one of those? No, with just which, which one would you like me to read? Uh, let's do 637. Yes. Let's just do that one. I mean, I just would hate for our viewers who are watching this segment just saying, okay, you're just plucking numbers out of the sky. It would be great just to show one example at least, uh, which shows that Muhammad himself testified that he was no miracle worker. Yeah. And they said, why is not a sign sent down to him from his Lord? Say, Allah is certainly able to send down a sign, but most of them know not. Mm. They're even asking, why is it you cannot have a sign? But before we do that, even in Surah 17, the answer is there, right after all these, uh, right, right after the Jews ask of this. If you look there, let me get up to uh, chapter 17 again, verse 90. And while you're doing that, I mean, it would contradict the miracle of splitting the moon. You would think so, right? <laughs> why would he detail it and say that I'm not, I'm not, and then go and perform a miracle? You would think it would be the simplest thing in the world just to do a miracle. Mm. Bring a, a, a plant back to life. Start a whirlwind in the desert. Mm -hmm. Have a little earthquake here or there. Mm -hmm. Heal somebody. Resuscitate the dead. Mm -hmm. Do anything. Even do what Jesus can do in the Quran. Mm -hmm. But this is what Muhammad says in response. Surah 17, verse 30, uh, 93. Glorified is my Lord above all that evil they associate with him. I am anything but a man sent as a messenger. Nothing more than a man sent as a messenger. I cannot do all these things, he's saying. I'm nothing more than a man sent as a messenger. Now, I ask Muslims, well, hold on a minute. Nowhere do we find any reference here that Muhammad did any miracle. Surah 54, Ayah 1, will set aside as a future rendition. Did Jesus do any miracles in the Quran? How about Surah 3, Ayah 49? Let's just see what it says. In Surah 3, Ayah 49, you'll see not just one, but a very uh, number of them. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to open it up to you to read it, because it's this that we need to set us, uh, uh, alongside. Why this. is that important, Pat? What, why are you showing us this? Because Muhammad could not do any miracles, but Jesus can, according to the Quran. Now, the Quran is very clear that he does it in the power of God. Let's read it. Mm -hmm. Referring to Jesus, and will make him Issa, Jesus, a messenger to the children of Israel, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, Jesus says, that I design for you out of clay a figure like that of a bird and breathe into it, and it becomes a bird by Allah's leaf. And I heal him, this is Jesus speaking, who was born blind, and the leper, and I bring the dead to life by Allah's leaf. Mm. So here Jesus is doing not just one, not twice, but four different miracles. He takes some mud, forms them into uh, uh, the uh, shape of birds, blows into them, they fly up into the air. Could Muhammad do that? No. No. He heals the lepers. Could Muhammad heal the lepers? No. He gives sight to the blind. Could Muhammad give sight to no. the blind? And he resuscitates the dead. Could Muhammad give us a, resuscitate the dead? No. No, he did just the opposite usually. Mm. So here you have four different miracles in one verse in Surah 3, Ayah 49, attributed to Jesus Christ. And you can look at the entire Quran. You can't find one reference to a miracle by Muhammad. Wow. So who's the greater prophet? Mm. So the whole question that the Jews are asking of Muhammad, they need to ask of Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfills that. Jesus actually uh, uh, fulfills the criteria of a prophet, whereas Muhammad cannot. It would have been the simplest thing in the world if Muhammad had just done a simple miracle. Something as simple as that. Not even the Quran suggests that he does a miracle. All these references that we talk about, Surah 17, Surah 2, Surah 6, Surah 13, Surah 17, all of them refer to his, uh, basically respond that he's nothing more than a, war, a mm. warner. Nothing more than a messenger. Not much of a defense. Now, being fair to Muslims, there are prophets in the Bible which did not perform any miracles. So the second, was there a, another test? What about, uh, were there some prophecies that were made that did come to light? I mean, it's, there's another way that we can look at this as well, can't we? Well, I would think be careful that uh, there were prophets that, that did not do miracles, but we don't consider them to be major prophets. See, Muslims don't just claim Muhammad as a minor prophet. Mm. He is the greatest of all prophets. Okay. He is the seal of the prophets. He is the last of the prophets. They don't just claim that he's like any other prophet. He is greater than all prophets, and he's certainly greater than Jesus Christ. 
Okay. Yet Jesus did all these miracles, Mama can't even do one. I see the So point. the fact yes. that he's the greatest, the seal, the final prophet, should suggest that he's greater than everybody that's yes. come before. It demands greater evidence. Yet he can't even do one miracle. Now, then we come to the, the next criteria, and this is the fourth one, and this is the one that I think that we need to really uh, get our hands into, and that is, did he know God, the God of the Bible? See, the God of the Bible is, is not just any God. Even his name is specific, and that's why I love, and I talk to my Muslim friends all the time, and I said, what God did Muhammad represent? And I say, well, he represented Allah, the God. That's what it means in Arabic, the God, Allah, definite article. That's a generic name. Anybody can be called the God. We have a reference in the Old Testament that's similar to that, Elohim. Elohim means the gods. Now that's interesting because even Elohim, when you look at it, if it had been singular, Eloi, my God, if it had been dual, it would be Eloha. The fact that it's Elohim means it's at three or more. Mm -hmm. that's, we could really unpack that a bit if we wanted to, but that's not what we're here to do at this time. Certainly that's probably the closest that you get to Allah because it's generic as well, the gods. But that's not the most important name. We know that there are three names for God that are very popular in the Old Testament. One is Adonai, which is a descriptive name for God. That's found 340 times. Elohim is more popular. That's uh, found 2,000 times in the Old Testament. But that was the name that was uh, satisfactory for Moses. Remember when God wanted Moses to go down to Egypt, he wanted him to go down and bring back the Israelites from Egypt. In Exodus 3, we see Moses trying to uh, stand against that. He's trying in every way possible not to go down to Egypt. He didn't want to do that. He tried to struggle. He said, listen, I'm not a good speaker. Let someone else who can speak better than me. Uh, then he finally turns to God and he says, well, tell me your name. What is your name? Mm. And let's just open up Exodus 3. That's right. Who because, should I say sent me? Yes. That's right. Let's just yes. open up and, and read it because it's very important you get to that. Mm. It's, he, wants God's pers he wants God's real name. He wants the God's... You might say his personal name, like you have a personal name. Mm. Your name is Rommel. Because you could imagine in that day, in that age, people would assume many gods. And so that it would be specific, perhaps this would be one of the reasons why Moses was asking that question. Yeah, that and also he, he, he was going to people that didn't really know him. Mm -hmm. They didn't trust him. He was going to have to produce, produce his credentials. Basically, he'd have to go down to the Israelites who were in captivity. They, were they distrusted everybody. And they would want to know who he represented. Mm. In the same way the Jews wanted Moses, I'm sorry, Muhammad to know who he represented. Mm -hmm. So we're, come, we're asking the same criteria that the Jews asked of Muhammad. In the 7th century AD, the Jews were asking of Moses in the 15th century BC. Mm -hmm. And Moses knew that. So he turns to God and he says, what is your name? So when I go down to Egypt, they'll know what God I represent. They'll know that that I represent you and specifically knew. Yes. Elohim was not good enough, that's generic. Adonai was not good enough, that was descriptive. He wanted to know God's personal name. And what is that name? It's right I, here I am. in Exodus 3, mm. verse 14. I am who I am, he mm. responds. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, this is verse 13, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me what is his name. Mm. Then what shall I tell them? Verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. In Hebrew, that would be Yahweh. Some would also, you could say Yehovah, because there's no vowelization in the consonantal text. It could be Yehovah, could be Yahweh. Most scholars today believe it's Yahweh, because Jerome mentions that it's Yahweh there in uh, the early periods of the Christian uh, of Christianity. Nonetheless, whether it's Yahweh or Jehovah, let's go Yahweh. I am who I am. Ego emi in Greek, Yahweh in Hebrew. Now look what he says next. The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. Oh, I love that. Mm. This is my name forever. This is the name that God gives to Moses at that time in 1400 BC, and every prophet knew that name. Every prophet used that name. Yes. 6,823 times you will find that name. Anytime in the English Bible you see L-O-R-D in capital letters, that's Yahweh. That's right. That yes. is it by far the most important name. Why? Because that is God's unique name. That is God's specific name. That is God's name that sets him apart from every other God. Every other deity. It's his exactly. holy name. Yes. So holy that no Jew would pronounce that name. Mm. Every time they read it in scripture, every time they come to that word, they replace it with Adonai. Mm -hmm. Why? They dare not pronounce God's holy name. It's so holy. Mm. And that's the name 
that we're looking for. If every prophet knew that name, shouldn't the greatest of all prophets know that name? Shouldn't the final of all prophets know that name? Exactly. Shouldn't the prophet that has come after every other, that's the seal of all prophets, should he not know that name? It's expected, So yes. where's that name here? Surely it's mentioned there, isn't not it? Not once. You won't find that name anywhere in the Quran. You won't find that in the Sarit of the Prophet. You will not find it in his Hadith, his sayings. You will not find that in the Tafsir. You will not find it in the Tahrik, the, any of the four genres of wow. the Islamic traditions. You won't find that name anywhere in Islam. Why? What's the reason for that? <laughs> well, this is what I ask my Muslim friends. If Muhammad is a real Prophet, why does he know God's name? Hmm. Every Prophet knew that name. Did Jesus know that name? Yes. Can you tell me where? Yeah. The passage, not exactly, but I John remember 8, exactly, yes. John chapter 8, 58. The Jews are there. They come to Jesus. To Jesus says, yeah. talks about Abraham. They said, how do you talk about Abraham mm. as if you know him? You're hardly 50 years old. How do you dare talk about Abraham? And Jesus turns to them and he mm. says, before Abraham was, ego Amy, I am who I am, mm. Yahweh. Mm. Look at the reaction of the Jews. They pick up stones to stone him because not only was he pronouncing that name, which they're not permitted to do, he was claiming it for himself. He yes. claims that name for himself. Ooh, I love Jesus. Hmm. He was saying, I am God right there. Now that's the name that we need to find. Every prophet should know that name. Jesus has used that name. He claims it for himself. If Muhammad is a greater prophet, if he's the final prophet, he should know that name. I can't find that name anywhere. And God says very clearly in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, this is my name forever. That means today, that means also in the 7th century AD. Why can't we find it on Muhammad's lips? Mm. Obviously, Muhammad never knew that God. Muhammad really not, didn't know that God. And people always come to me and say, well, yeah, okay, so what? What's in the name? I say, huge significance in the name. Because the name defines him. I am who I am. I need no other. Basically, he's showing that he is above anything else. He is not dependent on anybody or anything. What a God we have. Mm. But he's got a specific name, a holy name, and I want to get back to that name. And I think we need to get back to that name. And I know that a lot of Muslims say we share the same God and we share the same name because if you look in the Arabic Bible, the name for God in the Arabic Bible is Allah. Agreed. That's the name we've given there. And I think unfortunately so. In, in English, it's G-O-D, God, mm. which is a Druidic name. In every language, we take the name that is there. And I think we need to go back to all our Bibles, take out all those names and replace it with Yahweh. That's right. Just to get it straight. If you go to the original, you'll find the name. This is God's name. That's right. It was his eternal name. Yes. Muhammad never knew that name. Mm. What do we say? Muhammad is not in the prophetic line, strike one. Muhammad's revelation contradicts everything else that the prophets gave beforehand. God does not contradict himself. Strike two. Mm -hmm. Muhammad did not do anything to prove he was a prophet, could not do any miracles, could not do any prophecy. Strike three. Mm. Muhammad didn't even know God's personal name. He didn't even know what God he represented. And the God he represented, we don't have time to even unpack who that Allah was. It looks like it's a pre-Islamic pagan God. That's not the God I know. Mm. I can't find the Allah of the Bible in this book. Wow. Strike four against Muhammad. Mm. I don't have to go to Muhammad. I come back to Jesus Christ. Thank God he fulfills every one of those four criteria. Jesus Christ is in the right prophetic line. He does, uh, so everything he says corresponds with the prophet said earlier. Jesus Christ did miracles, right, left, and center. Even the Quran agrees with that. And he knew God's personal name. In fact, he claimed it for himself. Come on mm. home. Come on home to that Jesus Christ. Jay, there might be some Muslims who are watching this episode. They're convinced by what you're saying. What would you like them to do? Come on back to the Jesus. Come on back to the Bible. Get to know a Christian. Read the book of the real prophet. A prophet of God who is God. Mm. Came as a prophet, but more than a prophet. God in the face of a man who came not just to walk and talk amongst you and me, to die on the cross and rise again, to save us yes. for eternity. Yes. Come on home. Jay, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. It's been a pleasure. I mean, this is wonderful. Learning so much. I just want to know more. I can't wait until we do the next episode. Mm. To our viewers, we really hope that you've been able to see and be challenged for yourself. There is so much that you need to ask and question. I think this is the very thing sometimes we don't do. Uh, we've grown up as Christians. We've grown up as Muslims. We've grown up as whatever. But we don't question, why is it that I represent a particular faith? If you're a Muslim, I say this in love. Please question it. Why do you believe what you believe? Are you sure it's true? It won't make a difference now, but when you meet your God, it will make a difference. Please stay in tune for the very next episode of Midnight Cry and Make God.
か。